international biomedical and health research ethics training programs sponsored by NIH uh, United States, conducted in China, Shanghai, Beijing, and Wuhan from 2004 2000 to 2005. Bioethics training programs sponsored by CMB, conducted in China, Hangzhou, Chengdu, Xi'an from 2004 to 2005. Programs of training workshop on bioethics research ethics sponsored by Chinese CDC, a serious training workshop in different provinces. The trainees from all over the country, including in a regulator of scientific research, IRB chair, vice chair, the deans uh, of biomedical teachers of medical schools, uh, directors of institutes, editor of journals, and etc. By request, we have organized more than 20 workshops in the different provinces, such as Guangdong, Yunnan, Guangxi, Anhui, Hebei, Sichuan, Shanxi, Shanxi, Shandong, and the cities Beijing, Shanghai since 2003. So the, here's the main topics at the training workshop. A teaching method, lecturing, a lecturing, case discussion, exercise of writing informed consent, mock IRB, mock review, or something like that. Again, Again, welcome to Beijing. <laughs> welcome to Beijing, the exciting developing and uh, direct city in China in 2006. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Uh, any questions, comments? Yes, uh, Sheriff, please. Make me easy. <laughs> Make it easy. I make it difficult. <laughs> Thank you, It was very, very nice representation. Right? Because I found that when you are doing the training, you have included the editors of the journal also. Because, as you said, one of the uh, research publications, uh, which was considered as unethical by the editorial board, I don't know how they allowed the paper to be published. When they entered himself in field, you know, there was another article in British Journal of Arts and Gynecology. Uh, they have done some research on human subjects only for research purpose. So the editors were asked why they have published the paper. Yes. It's very good to see that you have brought up. Okay, thank you. Yeah, very good question. That is, we ask often actually, why they publish this this paper if this is an ethical paper? Because they they uh, from their article from their notes they they explain that because this is very useful in scientific in science. It's very, very good scientific paper. That is why. So it seems it can, it, in the, uh, it's very useful in science. And then they, they can a little bit compromise the ethical principles, it seems, from their opinion. That's a very good question we ask all of them. Thank you for your very interesting talk. Uh, I'm thinking uh, two things. I'm thinking one word you used is uh, 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 urgency, and the, and the, that it is urgent. And the other thing I'm thinking is scale and size of uh, the, the, the situation. Uh, and I think we can relate to uh, what, what happened with this uh, case of uh, surgery to other uh, issues, for example, release of uh, genetically modified organisms into the environment. What we uh, are considering doing with the release of the organisms is irrevocable. You can't get them back once they are released. Once you do surgery on these patients, you can't undo that surgery. These are irrevocable uh, actions. And, uh, in the case of uh, the surgery on the addicts, there are alternatives uh, to uh, that operation uh, which might be successful. And I'm not sure whether the uh, doctors who carried out that surgery were aware of those uh, alternatives. And uh, 
I think they ought to have um, uh, considered uh, the, the alternatives. Uh, the, um, when we're considering doing uh, such uh, no turning back uh, actions, I think people should be aware of how important it actually is and uh, that, that, that it really is a gigantic uh, issue and also how urgent it is. I mean, it is a, an immediate concern, a bit like a train coming towards you if you're stuck on the tracks. And uh, that's, that's not really a question, it's just a comment. Uh, I wonder thank what you, you have thank to you. say. I agree with you. Actually, we discussed this things during the expert meeting. Thank you. In the case of informed consent, do you have a variation in language uh, in different areas? If there is a variation in language uh, dialects, do you translate it into that? And then back translate and see whether the translation has been made correctly? Uh, yes, in some uh, project, we, uh, we conducted the, the project, the research project that is uh, when we obtain, uh, obtain informed consent is restricted like this. After the informed consent form or the procedure, will be a questionnaire or something like that to just test if the patient understands correctly. Thank you, Javier. The last question. Thank you, Yomi, for a very good talk. Um, I know several uh, people from your country have gone to... English, please. Sorry, just a joke. I know <laughs> several people from China that have gone to the US for training in Richard Cash's program like yourself uh, and uh, uh, gone back to China and I hope they're all working like you are in developing the research ethics. Um, but we can't rely, the third world, the developing world can't rely on the benevolence of the uh, US NIH or the CDC for developing our capacity in research ethics or in bioethics forever. Uh, what is uh, your center in particular and um, your NOH or the other agencies in China doing to develop bioethics capacity in particular um, indigenously? And um, I know that uh, you done a, a series of workshops in collaboration with Richard and other teams. Uh, but, these, uh, but these workshops are two, three, four day events. What other uh, programs like uh, educational programs have you got in place to develop sustained capacity in bioethics uh, that will produce bioethics teachers and academics for China? Thank you very much. English? Yeah, yeah, English. It sounds like English. <laughs> We've had that problem. Yeah. Just a tip because we are the uh, classmates and we study in Harvard School of Public Health. So, <laughs> so you, you need answer? Yes? Yeah, oh, okay, good. Professor Chu would like to answer this question. Okay. Thank you, Professor Chu. Uh, I would like to say something about. Uh, traffic and Mike, Mike. Okay. Wait, wait. Uh, uh, I will correct you. There are two uh, expert meetings with Oxford, Oxford uh, 2004. The second, the second one. Huh? Yeah, the so second one. Yeah, the second one. The second one. The March, in the March, and the more important uh, meeting. Uh, actually, the drug uh, use in China is illegal. Because the parliament have a, have a, a law to prohibit that, so the drug user uh, uh, should be arrested by the police, uh, put in the forced uh, use use about uh, near one hundred percent up to uh, they uh, get out from liquid, they use the drug again. So then, it's, it's a, another 
option is used surgery. But they are scientific merit and a lot of problems. A man is motivated by the making So you, you see that each patient has to pay 20 to 40,000 Chinese yuan. Actually, in China, the developer experiment to use a methadone substitution therapy. And when you, when, when it happened, so we have been with the one hospital to see very good. And drug use in the family, they are like to enter this into. So government now are trying to develop to 200, the, more than, uh, more than, right? more than yeah, 200 that is the clinics to so use the methadone. Mm-hmm. But still, they are uh, some better uh, uh, paradox or contradiction because at the one, on one hand, we have a law for drug use and put the drug use into the, into the, into the institute. And although we <coughs> try to develop this type of therapy, it's a very, 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 very yeah. country. Yes, so we just uh, visited several uh, sites for that, and professor, after that, <coughs> Professor Chu submitted a very important uh, report to the government, and the Ministry of Health said that it's a very good report. The uh, professor Chu just indicated those problems and asked the, asked for the, uh, asked for the government should pay more attention to this <coughs> conflict. Because uh, for the Methadone uh, Center, the, uh, the security couldn't get into there to get uh, arrest of those uh, drug users. But after they left, they drove, they said, 50 meters, and then get them to leave, or something like that. I think policies will not be uh, in, in accordance. It's often, I think, different, different agencies work in different ways. We, we thank you very much. Oh. We will. <laughs> We can let you know later okay. because the time. Okay, thank you for the last night. Thank you very much. So we have, I think, the next paper, and uh, after this paper, we'll have a morning tea. So, uh, Dr. Maroon, please, from Bangladesh, <coughs> on the current state of research ethics in developing countries and uh, where do we stand. Thank you. Actually, this paper uh, which I am going to present was scheduled to be presented on 13th, but uh, unfortunately, I was not presenting that day and I am presenting it now. It was actually a study, the title of this study is Informed Consent in Health Research. Current state of knowledge among physicians in Bangladeshi perspective. There is a research team, and we are working in Institute of Public Health, Dhaka, Bangladesh, and National Institute of Preventive and Social Medicine, that is known as NIPSAN, Dhaka, Bangladesh. And I am presenting this paper on the team. Prior to present my paper, just I would like to give you a very brief overview regarding Bangladesh. The official name, the People's Republic of Bangladesh. We are in Asia, South Asia. We have borders with India and Myanmar, and southern portion there is a Bay of Bengal. Area very small country, 147,570 square kilometer, but the population is very big. 128 million with a population density 868. Probably it is the world's most densely populated country. And current data is 140 million, the total population. Now again, I am coming back to my study. Objectives. General objectives 
of the study was to assess the level of knowledge regarding informed consent as a component of research ethics among physicians in Bangladeshi perspective. There are three specific objectives. The first one is to find out how much the physicians know about the fundamental characteristics of informed consent, such as extent of necessity and importance of informed consent, documentation format, whether it should be verbal or written, voluntary or involuntary in nature. The second objective was to assess the level of knowledge of physicians regarding basic elements of informed consent, such as explaining to the study subjects about the purpose of research, expected benefits of the research, and clean-cut description of possible risks and discomforts during the study. To measure the knowledge of the physicians about maintenance of confidentiality, rights, and well-being of the study subjects, and the compensation for any disability or death during study should be given or not to the patient. Now, methodology. This was a descriptive type cross-sectional study. Study place was National Institute of Cardiovascular Diseases, NICVD, Dhaka, Bangladesh. The study period, which was almost for one month, 16th January to 15th February this year. The study population, the target population were physicians who were enrolling in the time in the postgraduate courses of first, second and third parts under cardiology and cardiovascular surgery departments of that institute, that is NICVD, National Institute of Cardiovascular Diseases. Sample size. The physicians, that is postgraduate students who were available during the data collection period, actually it was a pilot study, a total of 46 medical doctors were interviewed purposely and convened. Now, let us come to the sampling technique. Just convenience sampling. These are tools. A self-administered structured questionnaire we used. Maximum questions were designed in Likert scale to measure the knowledge level of those physicians. And we analyzed the data by entering into computer by using the software SPSS. What were the main findings? We asked the physicians whether the informed consent is essential or not. 100% of them agreed that informed consent is essential. We used Likert scale based questionnaire, so there are some variations. Only 65.3 agreed to that strongly, but 100% agreed to that. Only 65.3% agreed to that strongly. Majority, that is 60.9% of them, opined in favor of informed consent, both in oral and written form. But only 21.7% thought that it should be in written only. More than 58.7% were not aware of an important aspect that consent forms need to be submitted for ethical clearance to a particular ethical review committee. 39.1% did not know that study subjects reserve all rights of withdrawing themselves from the study any time. All of them opined that study subjects should have the rights to know the purpose of research. 
8.7% remain confused whether all possible risks or hazards to the subjects is to be mentioned clearly in consent or form or not. Maximum 91.3% of them were aware of it. 32.6% were uncertain if informed consent should include the terms of compensation in case of loss, disability, and or death of study subjects. But more than half, that is 54.3%, strongly opined in favor of that. Most of them, 95.7%, either strongly agreed or just agreed that the well-being of the study subjects should be prioritized over the interest of science, according to Helsinki Declaration. Interestingly, all of the physicians opined that the study subjects should be ensured confidentiality or anonymity of regarding the research findings. Now, these are our, some recommendations from our research team. Though majority of the physicians were conscious about the informed consent, but a large number of them did not possess sufficient knowledge about basic elements and fundamental characteristics of informed consent. They were conscious, but actually they did not know the detailed components of the informed consent. And earlier I described that the physicians were basically postgraduate students in cardiovascular department and uh, cardiac uh, department of an institute, central institute of our country. And these physicians are enrolled, uh, they had to conduct studies among patients to complete their thesis the dissertation as a part of their course. As these courses are master's course, MD and MS, we call it. Uh, and so they require to complete a dissertation as a part of their course. It is important for them to be properly trained and knowledgeable in ethical issues of research prior to starting a study in order to complete their thesis. It should be prioritized to include more details of research ethics in the syllabus of undergraduate and postgraduate medical courses, particularly in developing countries. Because in Bangladesh, uh, under, uh, un we, in Bangladesh, at undergraduate level, there is very small uh, description regarding research ethics has been included in the syllabus at undergraduate level. In postgraduate level, there are the small uh, course on research methodology, but the research ethics portion is still lacking. Dissemination is an, another important issue. Dissemination regarding necessary elements of informed consent is recommended through various workshops, seminars, and training programs for the scientists and researchers who are working in the medical field involving human subjects. We have in Bangladesh an organization named Bangladesh Medical Research Council. They have started to train the doctors regarding uh, research methodology and research ethics as well. And thank you. Thank you very much for an excellent paper. <coughs> and I'll try to be in English. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, I'm surprised that among your uh, uh, conclusions and recommendations, you have not mentioned that you want to expand this pilot study of 47 to the rest of your country because uh, you've uh, chosen the site of NICVD, the National Institute of Cardiovascular Disease, where you choose the best of your graduates. <coughs> NICVD, I'm sure, chooses the best medical school graduates. If you were to choose uh, other institutes also, you'll probably have uh, different results. 
and I'm surprised that your results uh, are as uh, good as they are because you say that your medical schools do not teach research ethics courses uh, as is the case in Pakistan also and your, uh, the awareness is still pretty good. So um, if you were to include as you have recommended research ethics uh, education in your undergraduate level, the awareness will increase. But if you expand your study to other institutions, you probably will understand the other areas where you need to uh, focus on so that you can supplement your undergraduate education. <coughs> that is one. The other thing is that I'm sure you're aware that uh, the BMRC, the Bangladesh Medical Research Council, under Dr. Harun Rashid, already has a grant from the NIH and is educating uh, postgraduate level people for research ethics, which is focusing on that. So I think you guys are way ahead <coughs> in the region. Uh, my question is that how are you going to uh, uh, <coughs> conduct in such a densely populated area, uh, how are you going to uh, connect the undergraduate where there is absolutely no uh, research ethics or bioethics education uh, with the postgraduate? These, these are two various, two very, very different levels of education. How are you going to connect, uh, connect the two together? Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, earlier I mentioned this was actually a pilot study and we have a plan to expand this study all of, uh, among a large population, I mean among a large group of doctors. Uh, we have a plan if we... Uh, and uh, uh, regarding syllabus in undergraduate uh, level and postgraduate level, you have mentioned there is a big gap. Yes, I do agree. And actually, uh, in our country, uh, at undergraduate level, in fourth year, there is a subject community medicine. Under that subject, there is a very small portion uh, of that is epidemiology. And in epidemiology, while, while uh, they, uh, our teachers teach epidemiology, they describe some small issue regarding research and research ethics. That is not sufficient, we think, and that should, that must be changed, that should be elaborated properly. But at postgraduate level, in the second part, there, I, I mentioned there is two courses, MD and MS courses. Uh, these are three years course, that, and uh, uh, these courses have uh, three parts. In second part, there is a subject, research methodology and biostatistics as well. In that portion, research ethics may be incorporated appropriately. Thank you. Uh, we have an organization, already I have mentioned, that is BMRC, Bangladesh Medical Research Council. That organization looks at the matters regarding uh, the ethical clearance. And actually, postgraduate medical students, they need not to take any clearance from BMRC. They just submit their protocol to the concerned institute and the institute itself has a committee to uh, uh, to review the protocol or research proposal for dissertation or thesis and uh, i think this is a small gap because uh, if they require their proposal to submit to bmrc then they might be more aware regarding the informed consent and other issues the institute has the committee, they just uh, review the proposal and uh, for the course, for the course, for the academic purpose. They don't look at the research ethics uh, elaborately, I think. Okay. Uh, any other questions? I will speak in Bengali because you will understand. <laughs> well, we have very similar, you know, culture, heritage, history, everything. Uh, what I was wondering, I mean, in, in part of Bengal, where I come from, or in India in general, there is a strong resistance of the medical faculty uh, regarding incorporation of the ethics, so much so that they think that the ethics is kind of a uh, nuisance imposed on them. An institutional review ethics board is something just made up only the physicians 
and mostly by the friends and colleagues so that they can get the clearance so fast. And unlike uh, Victoria, state of Victoria, and I don't see any ethics review board who has got representatives from Minister of Religion or you know consumer advocacy or environmental activists. So your institutional board, I mean, how does it run? To be honest. Uh, actually, uh, this is a common problem in developing countries. We have the organization BMRC, but uh, there are bureaucratic complications, what should I say, bureaucratic complications, procedural delay. If some scientist submit a paper protocol for uh, a review or for ethical clearance, it, they take long time. And really, it is a problem. I do agree. And in our country, it is a problem. Like other bureaucratic uh, delay. Okay. Uh, yes, sir. I know that, I'm not sure whether there are any members of uh, ERCs from India in this room. Uh, oh, so, uh, well, I, I will uh, speak for. Sri Lanka, uh, because you mentioned the uh, developing countries. Now, uh, all the medical faculties in Sri Lanka have ethical review committees, and they have had for a long time, and they are functioning well. And the faculties have a rule that <coughs> nobody, uh, none of the academics belonging to the faculty, can publish or conduct research without getting approval from the ethical review committee. In addition to the faculty ERCs, there are also other ERCs. For example, the Sri Lanka Medical Association has one. So anybody else can also submit their proposals to these uh, committees. And uh, the Ceylon Medical Journal uh, has a rule that nobody can publish in that uh, without uh, getting a full approval. And also now we are going ahead uh, saying that no one can even present uh, research papers at academic meetings unless they have not ethical approval. So it can be done in this class. <laughs> Uh, younger people, uh, doctors and other academics do think it's a little bit of a nuisance, but once they're educated, uh, they do see, uh, come around to seeing it uh, from the point of view of the uh, ERCs. So it can be done, that's what I would like to say. Thank you. Thank you for the comment. Uh, I quite agree with the previous speaker. We have a critical review committee, which is made up of four professors, uh, dean, uh, you have the Archbishop, sorry, the Bishop, then you have another two religious leaders, you have a legal expert, a social expert, all of them they go through the paper, and they are given only 15 days' time to review and give the, uh, the committee's report for this. So it is in place, the most of the places in the world. Thank you. Uh, in this regard, just I would like to mention, uh, in our country, BMRC, only BMRC looks uh, regarding the matter of ethical clearance, but uh, actually, Every institute should have separate ethical review committee and research review committee. And then uh, it would be better. Okay. India and Sinopha is doing well. I'm happy to go. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, so, uh, just before the break, can I remind you uh, two things. One is uh, to fill up the questionnaire which is related to several things um, about the purpose of you coming to the conference and so on, and your knowledge of different things, including some UNESCO declarations, ethics teaching, um, mosquitoes and everything. Um, and uh, can I also remind all the speakers remaining, please, to give a PowerPoint files now so that we have these on the computer. Okay, and uh, we're intending to I'm attempting to make a DVD uh, with the uh, PowerPoint files of everyone and uh, the books on the conference in turn included. Um, so there are one or two people who have uh, mentioned to me that they cannot include their PowerPoint. But uh, if you cannot include them, please indicate to us. And, uh, uh, also, we will send out more information and a follow-up to the meeting about that. That's one of the ways to develop the materials for people is to uh, 
the papers from the conference and the uh, presentations. So please uh, enjoy your morning tea. And after morning tea, we'll, we'll have uh, four papers, and I'll tell you the order after tea. I'll tell the authors over tea. Thank you. This theme of public health and ethics is Mahala Sibelia from the United Nations University. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody, and thank you for inviting me to share with you my concerns and my hope and uh, my research. Um, as you know, the last century has brought many achievements in medicine, especially with regard to control of certain infectious diseases, tremendous developments in immunology leading to organ transplantations, and most recently the progress in decoding the human genome. In spite of these accomplishments, though, both health service consumers and practitioners are not always satisfied. The conventional medical system is often in trouble. At the same time, non-conventional medicine systems uh, receive great interest from the public and an increasing number of conventional medical practitioners as well. Its consumption is not limited to certain uh, social classes or to certain uh, cultures. Traditional, uh, this is the outline of my speech and I would go further to the difference between traditional medicine and alternative and complementary medicine, which are uh, usually uh, used uh, uh, substitutively, uh, but I would like to make, make a clear distinction between them. Uh, traditional medicine is something pertaining to the core of all cultures since the dawn of humankind. And traditional healing is uh, not only the solitary um, source of health care for the majority of the world's population, especially in rural areas of Asia, Africa, and Latin America, but it has started to be appreciated also as a potential source of remedies for illnesses which are uh, previously uh, thought uncurable. The importance of traditional healing uh, for illnesses uh, for indigenous peoples is however not only practical it is more often related to a particular cosmology and cannot be dissociated from religious concepts. Traditional health systems take into account physical, mental, spiritual, social and uh, ecological dimensions of well-being fundamentally trying to restore the balance uh, which by being destroyed produces disease. Treatments are designed not only to address the symptoms, but to restore the state of equilibrium within oneself and within the environment. Uh, traditional medicine is based on the principle that each individual has his or her own constitution and social circumstances, which result in different reactions to the causes of disease. Thus, different people uh, receive different treatments, even if, according to modern uh, medicine, they might be diagnosed with the same disease. This um, holistic approach um, is, um, as a patient, um, as a unit of body, mind, and uh, spirit, is one of the reasons why traditional medicine are increasingly popular in developed countries as well, in spite of the relatively uh, well-established conventional health systems. Traditional Chinese medicine, Ayurveda, um, uh, or yoga, Yunani medicine, uh, and others are formalized systems of diagnostic and therapeutic systems with a history of millennia. And they are recognized mainly in their uh, countries of origin as well as in other countries. However, there are um, more recent systems like homeopathy or Bach flower therapy, osteopathy, and many others, um, which uh, may be relatively new, but uh, their principles are founded in the laws of nature and extensive clinical experience of dedicated observers. They, these uh, practices are perceived to be more natural and less risky, and emphasize the preventive aspect of uh, medicine, the personal responsibility of uh, uh, the person in, uh, maintenance when, in maintaining one's health, 
And hence, the educated uh, public, which is increasingly aware of the side effects of uh, allopathic drugs, is choosing them if the option exists. In palliative, geriatric, medicine, neonatology, obstetrics, uh, the field is also gets wide acceptance. Therefore, they are alternative or complementary to the existing uh, Western mainstream medicine. Um, however, um, uh, looking at the statistics, it is interesting to note that in developed, uh, in industrialized countries, uh, over 50% of people have at least once have used uh, alternative and complementary therapies, um, up to 90% in Germany, I read. Um, and in the WHO acknowledges that 80% of uh, people in uh, all the, uh, in the world have only access to traditional medicine. Thus, these numbers combined, it is interesting to, to note that uh, <laughs> healthcare, which is mostly used by people, is ex actually outside the, uh, the recognized official system of medicine. Traditional healers are um, still marginalized and the recognition by health authorities has only begun in several countries. In spite of their numbers being 50 to 100 times uh, more numerous than allopathic health providers. In Africa, for instance, there is one uh, health, uh, 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 one traditional healer for 300 people in, on average uh, versus uh, Western trained uh, practitioners, one in 10,000 in, in uh, urban areas and 50,000 in rural areas. Traditional healers are usually integrated and accepted in the community. Uh, and they are, uh, as I said, looking for the root causes of disease, which are sometimes spiritual and holistic, aiming at healing the individual and their communities, often playing a role as a um, mediator between spirits and humans. Also from the economic point of view, traditional medicines are preferred, being less expensive. Uh, this trend is also particularly evident in countries in transition, where uh, traditional remedies have become the major resource for health use uh, as funds dwindled for pharmaceutical products used in conventional medicine. But not only, in um, uh, industrialized countries also the expenses which are usually out of the pocket, it's, uh, they are not covered by health insurance, are uh, steadily increasing in all developed uh, industrialized countries. Um, According to the WHO, the degrees of recognition of traditional healers uh, by the formal governmental health system is uh, either um, fully integrated, as it is in China, in Vietnam, and in Korea, uh, included but not completely integrated, as in a number of uh, countries, or just tolerated. However, most countries, uh, in most countries, traditional healers are not usually uh, uh, recognized and do not interact with the rest of the medical community. Um, however, recently, um, government, local and uh, non-governmental organizations have recognized that uh, integrating uh, traditional healers into uh, public health programs is very useful uh, for reaching uh, into the communities and uh, have uh, started programs to recognize them. Our research at the United Nations University Institute of Advanced Studies uh, <coughs> includes a, a number of case studies in uh, several countries looking at the um, experiences of integrating um, uh, the traditional healers into uh, the existing or uh, non-existing yet uh, systems of uh, health care. Um, I don't have time to go into details, uh, although I would have loved to share with you the experiences in uh, Cote d'Ivoire or Mongolia, uh, but uh, probably on another occasion. Um, <coughs> oh, sorry. Um, this is uh, an example, uh, a photograph taken in uh, a market in uh, Cote d'Ivoire where uh, necklaces uh, uh, 
are sold uh, in order to uh, prevent one from, uh, as a preventive measure. And there are all, all kinds of, uh, of preventive medicine included in this, uh, in this necklaces. Of course, they, they have uh, many herbal uh, medicines and so on. Um, the, uh, yes, the government of Cote d'Ivoire uh, is introducing legislation to recognize, to license traditional healers and of course to uh, produce a database on medicinal plants and uh, is uh, hoping to have a, a, a department of traditional health uh, medicine in the Ministry of Health and pub, uh, of Public Health. In Mongolia as well, um, traditional medicine is recognized as a, a national heritage and very important uh, for uh, the uh, lives of, uh, of people who are very scattered over a, a huge territory and uh, uh, where people have uh, uh, lived uh, in harsh conditions for, for centuries. They have developed uh, particular uh, methods of uh, diagnosis and uh, healing which are uh, very efficient uh, in, uh, in their life conditions. And since 1999, uh, the um, National Parliament, the Great Kural, has uh, adopted a document uh, covering uh, traditional medicine, including a training of healers, and most importantly, training of uh, Western-trained medical doctors in traditional medicine, which is a very important aspect since uh, usually Western-trained medical doctors are um, uh, reluctant to accept uh, because of lack of knowledge or because of prejudice or because of many other reasons. Um, <coughs> the, in order to be accepted as a safe and effic um, efficient uh, way of treatment, traditional medicines need to be further researched and um, more uh, to, to prove the validity of these age-old remedies. However, protocols for clinical trials should be designed according to the specificities of the tested substances and the cultural sensitivities of the peoples who have used these therapies for generations. It is, um, uh, this is one, one aspect. The other is that um, this uh, herbal medicines uh, the interest in them is partly because they are uh, natural and uh, the connection with nature and well-being is well established. At the same time, we have to take care of uh, the sustainable use of medicinal plants uh, and uh, animal products, Most of them, many of them which uh, are coming from endangered species. Also, it is uh, known that 25% of modern drugs are based upon plants first used traditionally. And in recent years, un, uh, famous, infamous cases of biopiracy have made the headlines. Pharmaceutical companies are undertaking research in the herbal pharmacopoeia of indigenous peoples and have patented uh, products without even acknowledging the peoples uh, they have taken the knowledge from and um, forget about uh, sharing the benefits with them. Uh, in terms of intellectual property rights, the present international system does not seem to fit the specific laws uh, governing the ownership of traditional knowledge, including that for healing purposes. Uh, in conclusion, I would like to say that um, traditional practitioners are often uh, the only resource of uh, medical care. Um, they uh, should be trained also in a respectful manner in other um, aspects like anatomy or physiology. Um, the, in, in order to uh, close the gap uh, uh, which separates them from the Western trade medical pr practitioners because prejudice against them is persistent world over. And uh, there are numerous papers uh, underlining the fact that collaboration is possible and has yielded valuable uh, results for public health benefits. Also, um, I uh, 
and uh, I have read a very nice metaphor by a, a professor from Vietnam who mentioned that the uh, two paradigms of medicine uh, should be considered like the uh, wings of a bird. So you, you can't use only one without the other one. Uh, policy development, infrastructure development will be needed according to the varying uh, priorities in different countries. However, in my <laughs> this, this would be the official part. Uh, the issues remaining uh, ethically are whether we should uh, um, what should prevail, the age-old wisdom or modern clinical trials for validating the traditional medicines? Or when should one forgo up-to-date treatment, especially if it is still experimental, or embrace traditional alternate uh, therapies, including spiritual ones? Should the cost of uh, traditional medicines be covered by en health insurance, if the system exists in the country? Uh, there is a need for mutual recognition and respect of practitioners for each other. Um, and uh, as I said before, uh, equitable benefit sharing with the indigenous peoples who have uh, uh, donated or who have uh, given their knowledge for new drugs. Thank you very much. And I'm Thank you, Camilla and Irene. And um, okay, let me see. Irene first. Sorry, Irene, Irene. Sorry. E A New Zealanders can't I'm going to speak in English. <laughs> uh, just a short comment on this last paper. Must it be and or? Surely age old wisdom and modern clinical trials, up to date experimental treatment and alternative therapies because each can give so much to the other so that the totality is going to be so much bigger. So instead of antagonism, yeah. a cooperation. Thank you. I'm just wondering, given the um, ethical dilemmas of medicine that we've heard this morning already and um, I know some of my friends are alternative healers. So um, can you comment on some of the country's philosophies on how they instigate or professionalize or alert natural healers to the ethical principles of informed consent uh, around alerting their patients to side effects or you know things that may happen? Uh, can you comment on that? Or <laughs> Uh, I wonder whether you, you refer to uh, traditional healers uh, or complementary alternative uh, uh, medicine professionals because yes. it's, it's very different I, yes, I yeah. suppose. Traditional healers I understand are not often uh, keen of, uh, of being integrated. They, they have their authority in the community, they have their knowledge and they don't necessarily need to, to be uh, Acknowledged or recognized. Uh, of course, the government would like to recognize to, to, to license them in order to to have an evidence of who is doing what and how. And uh, but uh, it's it's a problem yet uh, to allure them to to be sensitive to this kind of issues. On the other hand, traditional medicine, um, alternative medicine practitioners in develop industrialized countries have uh, a quite a rigorous system of uh, validation and registration of national exams and uh, they have to pass strict uh, tests for being recognized. Lord, please. Um, I'll give you this one. Yeah. Thank you, Makila, for a very um, lucid presentation and a very important area in, in the interplay and the complementarity of traditional versus um, the orthodox uh, medic uh, Western medical practice. Um, I have some feelings about this because um, 
while I believe there are healers that ha there, who have these skills over many generations perhaps and we do know, do know about the side effects of these, these medications and on the other hand you have the medical practitioners who are well versed in clinical trials and risk assessments and that sort of thing. Um, in Malaysia I've noticed that the sort of pseudo healers or the pseudo uh, medical specialists who are trained in neither have found a niche in uh, saying that traditional medicines are really good therefore they have come up with a lot of products these are very illustrious people to actually commercialize and market thousands of medicines that are considered natural that are plant derived etc and, and um, we have tested them in the University of Medical Center a colleague of mine is interested in, in this area and out of the 2,000 or so preparations which actually do not go under the purview of the Ministry of Health because they are seen as supplements. We really don't know where, where they belong but they are marketed openly. You can buy something very easily in the night market or sometimes in, in shops. Um, um, where do, do you see this and, and what, what practices are there in countries to actually regulate this sort of practice? Because sometimes, most of the time, it does more harm than good. Okay. And we're seeing a lot of cancer patients coming with third degree and fourth degree stage cancer where nothing really can be done very much because they have resorted to taking all these supplements uh, and thinking they can cure them. Thank you. Thank you for, for this uh, uh, comment. It, it is indeed a very important question because, uh, w and this is why I emphasize that uh, they need to be to be recognized and they, there need to be a standard for them to to produce uh, to to produce products and to market them. Not anybody who just dreamt overnight of a product can come over and and sell it because people in desperate situations will buy it so this is why it is necessary to have uh, to have a, a strict regulation of, of theirs but for this reason the governments need to to understand that this uh, niche this this uh, influx exists it is not only the that they have to uh, fund uh, Western medical institutions uh, they, they have to find a way of uh, looking for for these people who have, uh, who, of course, for commercial uh, or even for genuine reasons, but it's it's only in certain conditions or under certain circumstances that the product uh, uh, works, and they are not uh, trained in giving the the proper instructions to this. So it is uh, an important part to be to be recognized by the health authorities in the respective countries. Thank you. The uh, last question from Aruna. We have uh, it's not a question, it's a comment. And I'm just adding to your paper when you have mentioned there must be mutual recognition and respect of practitioners. I don't think uh, the allopathy practitioners recognize the in our country, the Siddha and the Ayurveda, especially when they give treatment for uh, mm, fallopian tube blocks. Of course, uh, the Siddha and Ayurveda, to do away with the fallopian tube blocks, they have to conduct medical tests which are necessarily allopathy. But uh, the allopathic doctors, they don't recognize the, uh, the contribution made by the Ayurveda and Siddha in this respect. And as my Malaysian friend pointed out, there are pseudo healers, like those who give advertisements every day, every half an hour they give advertisements in the TV, saying that they have a cure for HIV AIDS, but they don't have. People trust them, people trust them and they go behind them, but they just spend money and uh, it results in deterioration of health, and that alone is there. And your other point, equitable benefit sharing with indigenous people. I think uh, at least uh, 20 to 30 percent of the population also take two. It is not just uh, Ayurveda and uh, Siddha that exist in India. In addition to that, there is what you call traditional medicine, Yunani, which is the Islamic traditional medical practitioners who also exist in India. Thank you. Okay.
Thank you very much. Thank you, Mahala. Okay. okay, so the next paper is also on medicinal uh, plants, and uh, well, medicinal plants rather than medis traditional medicines. Um, are you here from uh, the Marshall Islands? Thank you. So I can make a comment while I'm, oh it's up, can't make a comment. <laughs> what I was going to say is that what we've learned in, in this session um, and in the previous sessions is that there are charlatans in both allopathic as well as, you know, like the, the brain thing for, uh, for drugs. So we have to be uh, uh, ethical in, in all areas. Let, let me first see if I can work this. I'm going to give you a quick zip through a geography uh, lesson so that uh, you can see where we are. We're in the heart of the Pacific Ocean. So if the heart is functioning well, the rest of the uh, organism will do okay. And so uh, it's, even though we're very tiny, there we are. Uh, <coughs> um, we, we have a, a voice and uh, a part to play in this whole system. So the Marshall Islands um, comprises about nine, 29 atolls and five raised islands, and we're right there in the heart of the ocean, um, very small, there's uh, the flag. Uh, that's what an atoll looks like, in case none of you know. We have lots of little islets. Um, I think um, there are about uh, 2,000 altogether of these little islets and so you can see that land is very scarce, very vulnerable, very precious to the people. So we have a land mass of 90 square miles in a sea area of nine, uh, 700, uh, sorry, 70 square miles in a sea area of 750,000 square miles. Maybe our remoteness is, um, is an advantage. Uh, we have a huge population, as you can see, about 65,000 people, uh, but it grew <laughs> from the 11,000 at the beginning of the 20th century, and we have a gross domestic um, product uh, per capita of about two and a quarter thousand US dollars. That's what the, um, the urbanization has done to two of the atolls. Uh, we have 32,000 people in the capital, and then Ebai on Kwajalein Atoll, which is the largest atoll in the world, has 13,000 people. And we were subjected to a colonial history, and uh, I'll just sit through this from Spain. Uh, we got our name from the British, though they never wanted, they just passed by. Uh, we got the missionaries in 1857, and then um, Germany claimed the Northern Pacific, and uh, then we had Japanese, um, and then, of course, uh, <coughs> after the Japanese, in came the Americans, and it was a trust territory, and then this is what they did with the trust. Uh, 67 nuclear tests from 1946 to 1958, the statistic is that it was the equivalent of one of the bomb, the Hiroshima bomb, uh, every 12 days uh, from 1946 to 1958. That's the equivalence of the, um, so you can see that the country has been, forget about bio pirates, but the other pirates were there in plenty in the past and the country is dealing with that um, right up to today. <coughs> 